No. Broadcasting. All right, we should be live. Live. Right on. We good? Um, open. It's loading. Oh, we're good. Now we're live. Okay. And it looks now like. we tweet, and then I retweet. Okay. Yes. Well, now we've got Hangouts on air. Okay. Is one of our internet connections really bad? I don't need torrents running or anything. Okay. Uh, it's not working again. Okay. Well, hang on. Let's test something out. Okay. Now it's working first, again. First, I'll do this. And we'll see if that improves anything. If it does, then I'm going to need to change my profile picture stat. I'm going to turn off my Wi-Fi. And... All right, you're back. Ugh, this is a mess. I never had this problem with Abner, but what weird is your... You there? Yeah. Your video feed is fine for me. All right, wait, your video's off now. Yeah, I turned it off just to like as a test to see what would happen if it would improve anything. Gotcha. All right, let's try turning it back on. Okay. Pop. Okay. How is it now? Like our video feed and audio feed between each other is fine. Right. So it's you think and it's so just like this seems like a Google problem to me. And even when you're on audio okay. only, which our video feed and audio feed between each other is fine. Okay. Right. Right. All right. Now the live is working fine with only your audio on my phone. Yeah, see, on my end, when I'm looking on my phone, all I see is my head or my my. Yeah. Phone. Okay. Turn your turn your video on now, and let's see if it drops off because it's working fine now. Sure. Okay. Uh a, uh, a hit disable HD. It kicked me out, but I got back in. Uh, the video feed's just not working at all. Like it's just stuck. Abner and I have never had this problem. And your feed's fine. Yeah. Oh. The video feed's just not working at all. Like it's just stuck. It's working on my phone, but it's it's very, very rate. delayed and very low frame rate. looks a million times better on my phone than it does on the Hangouts, though. And the thing is, we use the audio from this to publish the podcast on audio platforms. So if it's not working reliably, then...
Oh no, would that make a difference though? Because we're already live. Crap. Okay, let's just test this for a second and see how it goes. I don't think this is going to be any better, actually. Well, at least it won't have any frame rate issues. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> let's just test this for a second and see how it goes. I don't think this is going to be any better, actually. Well, at least it won't have any frame rate issues. <laughs> That's true. Dang it, we have a lot of people on, too. Those poor people. Hello, people. Hello, friends. That's true. Hey, we have a lot of people on, too. Those poor people. Oh, okay. God. It's looping. Oh, okay. God. It's looping. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Going back to video. Speedtest.net, or should I just Google speed test? And... Okay, I've got like 100 megabytes. I've got like 100 megabytes down. Megabits. Sorry. Sorry for all those technical people. Megabits. Isn't that, isn't that supposed to be us? Yes. It's supposed to. Oh my God. Well, if nothing else, my up is faster than my down, but they're both in the, like the. 12 to 15 range. Ooh, that's not good. Well, I mean, it should be fine for this. Yeah. My download's like 115. Yeah. My... Okay. So, and my up is like 8. So that might be the problem. Maybe. Did you have your video live when you tested? Yeah, I mean, it's like it's 10 like right now as I'm testing being live. That should be fine. That should be, be fine. Let's just do that. Okay. Um, uh, being and then we'll just go. It's not our speed. It's Google, I think. All right, here we go. Tweeted. Nice sound effects. Thank you. <laughs> and hopefully the stream just fixes itself, maybe. We'll see. Let's hope the archive is fine. Uh, just do it enough. Yep. Yep. Cool. Good to go. on the show many a time whenever we've talked about fuchsia how's it going man i'm just so glad to be here man <laughs> with the ac week i've had i'm just glad to be here yeah you've been sick having I mean, alphabet scoop and we tend to on it like in general cover uh the stories from the prior week but we're not really doing that today because we're pr focusing primarily on fuchsia so before we do that um i thought we'd just dive into some of these stories so first of all uh, Google Home is rolling out continued conversation. So that's something that Google announced back at I.O. Uh, and uh, Google's rolling it out. So it's basically this feature that Google showed off showing, which is essentially um, it allows you to have a continual conversation with Google Home without having to say the hot word over and over. 
Um, so you can say like hot word and then ask Google about something. And then in the context of that, you can just follow it up with another question without having to say the hot word, which is going to set off all your phones if I say it um, again. So that's that. Um, that ro that's rolling out this week. I, I haven't seen it on my uh, Google Home app yet, but our Abner and Justin are. So it seems like it's just rolling out slowly. And, uh, you know, some of us have it and some of us don't. But that's a pretty cool feature. And it's just nice to see that Google's just slowly rolling out uh, these Google Home things. One of them, another one was uh, being able to like ask multiple queries within one or multiple questions within a query. And that rolled out or started rolling out a week or two ago. Um, and then another th another piece of the puzzle here is pretty please, which is another feature Google showed off, which basically like you can say please to your Google Home and it will respond positively to to your uh, to your, your your niceness, I guess. Um, next up this week, we had YouTube Music and YouTube Premium, which we've been talking about for weeks. Uh, it's finally officially rolling out to 17 countries. Um, and Google also detailed family pricing for that. So for those who don't know, Google is seemingly slowly but surely moving away from Google Play Music, although everything you've come to know and love about Play Music is still live today as of right now. Um, but it looks like in the long term, they're going to be moving their music streaming offerings over to YouTube Music. And YouTube Premium is basically just YouTube with a new name. Um, there have been some slight pricing changes across the board to accommodate uh, YouTube Music. Um, but yeah, you can head over to the Play Store, download the YouTube Music app if you want. There's a free tier, which is obviously not supported, unfortunately. Um, but you can pay, I think it's $10 a month to get the full premium subscription or the, the, the music subscription. Um, so if you want to do that, you can do that in, you can do that if you live in one of 17 countries around the world. Uh, YouTube, uh, Google tested YouTube Music and Premium in five countries initially, uh, but now it is rolling out to 17. So uh, much, much wider diversity of users now. Uh, and lastly, I just wanted to mention the uh, Google One, which is something that Google also announced just after IO, didn't make the keynote for, for whatever reason. Um, it's basically Google trying to uh, unify all of your, you know, managing, you know, all the storage you use across all of Google's uh, apps and services. So uh, if you have a premium drive subscription where you're paying for 100 gigs a month or whatever right now, that's automatically going to be transitioned into a Google One account. But Google One is more than just storage because it also serves as a hub for Google, um, like contacting Google support if you have problems with uh, using photos or G Gmail. And we've talked about that on Alphabet Scoop before about how it's kind of a big deal that Google's uh, adding this avenue for contacting support for these services. Um, and you can also manage family plans. And then you can also access these like perks or whatever that Google's giving uh, people who sign up for Google One. So if you download the, you can download the Google One app in the Play Store right now uh, and sign up for, you know, to be notified when your account uh, gets moved over. I'm pretty sure the people, uh, who work for 9 to Google who've already had their account merged over, they can email when that happens. So you don't have to keep checking the app. You should get an email uh, when your Drive account has been has been uh, uh, migrated. So that's pretty much the biggest stories of the week. We don't really have to talk about them. They're not really that you know in important, I guess, uh, but they were the most important stories of the week uh, <laughs> considering this is, you know, summer is usually slow for news, uh, for for most most tech companies, um, so yeah, the most important stories may not have been that that important, um, but we did want to get those out of the way before we dive into uh, fuchsia. So let's do that. Uh, finally, so let, I'll just start off by asking you, Kyle, and this is your this is this is your moment. Uh, what is fuchsia, and and why do you care about it? Oh, I've been I've been expressing why I like fuchsia for for. And some other interesting things. Yeah, which... and it's it's a pretty big deal for an operating system to not be based on Linux in some way. <laughs> yes, indeed. Even Android is very much so Linux based. Uh, some say that that uh, OS ten and Linux have common uh, roots. Right. So to to have something that breaks away from that is unheard of, really. I mean, it, it, I was looking at the history of some of the the of other operating system kernels, and it's been about twenty years or more since a, a true 
competitive operating system kernel has been created. So it, it, it's an interesting thing to, to, to see happen. Yeah. And so what's, what's, uh, if it doesn't use Linux, what's Fuchsia's kernel called? <laughs> it's, it's called Zircon. I, for the life of me, I don't know where they got the name. It used to be called Magenta. So it seemed like they were picking colors or flowers at first, and now they're picking stones. Like, um, the, there's, there's other, I don't know why Fuchsia kept its name. I'm thinking it might not be final, but the, there's four other or three other names that have been chosen for uh, for pieces of fuchsia. Like like I said, the the but one of those is the iPhone's operating system. It's supposed to represent the iPhone's ten. I think one of them was the hardware of the iPhone, right? Or maybe I'm wrong. I can't remember. And I the I'm not sure, but I remember the 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 desk. The other one was what was going or one of the competitors to become what is now OS 10. There were two, there was a, a, a history. I'm sure the people at nine to five Mac would be more than happy to correct me on, on the history here, but it's uh, there were two operating systems that were competing to be the next Mac OS. And instead they chose Steve Jobs's vision and went with that, but people looked what was there. And so they're trying to piece together that with a, or people think that they're trying to piece that together with a mobile operating system to make something unified. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm trying to find that exact, like, I really wish I could find the mention of it. It's maybe it was, maybe it was Ron at Ars Technica that wrote about this originally. Speaking of Ron, he was kind of like, I think he was the first person to notice your work. Uh, he was, he, he was originally when Armadillo uh, from a blog that was talked to you with that were testing their designs on Android and iPhone devices. So I was able to build it just like they did and it ran just fine. I was like, my God, is this what it's going to look like? Put an article on Reddit and next thing you know, I'm, I'm all over the news. Yeah, yeah you, you didn't even know it at the time, but uh, we we used your tutorial uh, to get it running on on one of our Pixel phones, and Hayato Huseman at the time was doing videos for us, and he uh, he did a video uh, showing off Armadillo on a Pixel, and then so that was kind of like I think that was kind of Fuchsia's like breakout moment, in, I guess in terms of like public awareness about it. Absolutely, like the that it was. I didn't do it on purpose, I promise. But yeah. <laughs> just a month before, or just a month later, was IO seventeen. So I didn't do those on purpose again. But that's what led. I assume that's what led to somebody asking at the Android Fireside chat. You know, hey, what's Fuchsia? Report. There were reports in like twenty sixteen that Google was working on some kind of internal project to merge Chrome OS and uh, Android. And obviously, we're here in 2018, and, and there's no sign of, of that happening. In fact, it seems Google is doubling down on Chrome OS that Google is working on something old. It was, it was rooted in Android. It was, it, was like, it, was a, it was like a fork of Android rather than being something entirely new. Um, and it basically made Android very, like, uh, in terms of, like, UI and stuff, like, it, it was... It was uh, it was better for, to be used across laptops and tablets and phone. It, it was it was it was basically an attempt to make Android, you know, across like a cross platform operating kind of what like what what Microsoft has done or you know like kind of what Apple's well Apple's sort of doing more of the Chrome OS approach right now with Marzipan, but that was kind of in I, I'm I'm pre, I'm and it seems like they tried it with Android and then they decide nah and then Fuchsia kind of emerged out of those ashes. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with that. Especially the the need for Andromeda dropped significantly when they realized probably how much easier it would be to just instead of making Android more Chrome OS like they just enable Android apps on Chrome OS, which still was no easy task. But it was far easier than building a new system from the ground up. But right. I, th I think, it, or it could be another another situation. Like we had said with uh, 
where Apple had had two competing next generation operating systems in development at the same time, only to choose one and leave leave the other behind. So it could very well be that Andromeda was in the works and just never made it far enough to see the light of day. Yeah, one thing I was thinking about though with that was if like if they wanted to make Android like better to run on on laptops, for instance, uh, it's a lot easier to update existing Chrome OS laptops with a version of Chrome OS that runs Android apps and to the end user would though. Right, exactly. It's it, it was all already there. Just use what's available. I mean, it's interesting though that now that you mentioned that like something running something so drastically different on an existing Chromebook, the Fuchsia runs today on the Pixelbook. Yeah, that's that's as, as that's true. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about what Fuchsia is and, and how it works. So as far as I understand from, I, to make it clear to anyone who's listening, I, I'm kind of as much on the outside of this as I am on the inside of it. So uh, my, all of my understanding about Fuchsia has pretty much come from Kyle's, Kyle's article. So props to you for that. Um, but it does leave me kind of a little bit like, you know, I'm, I'm learning too. So uh, maybe maybe listeners can can like relate to me um, in that way. But uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how 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 Fuchsia is different from Android. So I'll, there, I guess the public perception is like I, the most boiled down version of it is Fuchsia is going to replace Android. Um, or at least that's like how people, you know, think about Fuchsia, I think, um, even though that's doesn't know, it doesn't seem exactly true. Um, but what, what, it, what is Fuchsia and how is it different from Android and, and one Chrome and Chrome OS for that matter? So a couple, a couple things like Android is very much so mobile focused. Right. You know, they, they, it's it's tried to do tablets, and then tr they, people have tried to turn phones into desktop environments. See, you know, like Samsung Dex and similar setups like that. But Android was never really designed to do that. At first, of course, though, it, it was it was designed to be a physical keyboard and with physical buttons and no touchscreen. But people didn't like that, so they right. built everything, and it's always been touch since then. Right. Well, that was also pre iPhone and post iPhone. <laughs> right. 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 Exactly. So go figure. Uh, Google copying Apple again a little bit, but uh, yeah, I, I think I think Google was probably considering working on you know doing an all screen device like the iPhone before Apple. You know, I I don't think it was like a direct like copy, but I think I think the iPhone was like a oh wow this is coming a lot faster than we thought. And wake then, up. I, yeah. Google was like, oh, and then they, you know, they obviously shifted directions really fast. Um, but yeah, let's talk a bit, a little bit about how Fuchsia is kind of like, you, you've covered this in your articles, but we, there's like, there's, there's an, an, a user interaction kind of philosophy that we've come to be very familiar with and very comfortable with on our phones, which is basically you, you unlock your phone and then you open an app. Like that's that's basically the 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 workflow of using an iPhone of using any phone a smartphone, right. um, and There's from our understanding is Fuchsia is departing from that basically, and it's more uh, it seems like it's kind of to me Fuchsia feels like the epitome of what Google originally hoped for with Google Now when they announced that, um, but doing it in the obviously in the form of an entirely different operating system, starting with a completely different uh, pers like got kind of goal in mind for what they want the operating system to be rather than being something built on top of Android. Right. So like the 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 core of it is that apps aren't a, a single thing anymore. It's it's they're they can be split up into smaller pieces. And in some ways that's that's completely different from, and in a lot of ways that's completely different from Android, but these pieces can also be opened up individually or multiple times which is a, a huge departure from Android. Like I've seen apps that duplicate an app on your phone so that you can have two copies of it open, but that seems silly. You know, why, why should you have to do all of that? Where instead you can run this piece and this piece 
side by side or at the same time. Like if I want to have two calculators open, I either need to have a special calculator app that let that shows two calculators, or I need to have two different apps. There's no easy way to have two calculators, which is something that happens. So, right. and each of these little pieces is called are called modules, and and modules to some are, may be familiar, just because like Linux was said to be modular, but some say it didn't pan out quite that way. But um, if you, what's really radical, the big radical change is that instead of things being organized by tasks, like if I open my phone right now and look at look at my recent, it's all recent tasks. Right. Or, or recent, you know, recent apps. Where what Fuchsia is going to do is have what they call stories. And stories are going to... Stories are going to really change the way we work with computers, not just on phones, but on laptops too, or just about anywhere really. It's it's changing from a window mindset to a, a, a task mindset where you're trying to get something done and you need two or more or even just one module or app to get things done. Like if right. I want to order delivery or something, I might need Google Maps to find somewhere good, and then a, a web browser to go to their ordering site or whatever. I mean, mm -hmm. There's plenty of ways that that can look, I guess. Is what I'm right. To so like, just to boil it down, what you're basically saying is the way we use phones today is we, we, we have hundreds of apps, and we do we use the different apps to do different things. And we have to jump between them to use them all to kind of form our own story of what it is we're trying to do. We have to do that ourselves. We have to you know, open up the Uber app and book the ride. And then we have to go into Google Maps and make sure the the place we're going is open and then you know whatever and then we go into the, the we go into the the app for chick-fil-a to make our order and we have to do that ourselves we have to formulate that process ourselves and go between different tasks whereas what fuchsia is trying to do is they're trying to say they're, they're they're using this modular system of you know apps can be broken in broken into many many pieces you know it, if you're familiar with the concept of, of modularity in software you can just think about it in hardware which is you know, you could think about Project Aura or you could think about um, these other attempts at modularity in phones where it's like they break apart the each individual functions of a, of a phone into different pieces. And that's basically what what apps built for Fuchsia are, correct? Like you you as an app developer build your app in 100 different pieces and then Fuchsia basically weaves together those pieces to create what Fuchsia calls a story. And so now the way we interact with our devices is... So, but you're, you're open to the world of being able to ask the assistant to do something, and it can open you know, two, three, seven different apps to get that job done. Or one app can pass to another app and choose to open another app that will continue where it left off, which I think right. is so cool. I mean, of course, a lot of that is going to be this, you know, two modules in the same app, like uh, YouTube, a YouTube video versus YouTube comments are likely going to be two different modules. So, you know, you could watch two videos at once, or you could have the the video and look at the comments or whatever. It's going to be similar to to that, but yeah, yeah. And I assume that there's going to be a big aspect here of of Google using machine learning to figure out which apps you prefer, which apps you use for different tasks, and then, you know, tethering or, or, or you know, like building that experience to, to, to you. So the way, the way one story might look for you would, might look, even for the same task, you know, booking a ride for you, you know, the assistant may, you, may know that you use Lyft, you don't use Uber. And first, another person, they may build a story that uses a module from the Lyft app uh, or, you know, like, so like there's, it seems like to me that there's going to be a level of machine learning that's going to personalize things to an extreme degree, maybe to a degree we've never seen before. 
Although um, I don't know if I don't know if that's in the sort the fuchsia source code, but surprisingly, yes, it is. Uh, when the, what it does is uh, when it's trying to figure out which module to use, first it looks at na uh, verbs and nouns, so like book a ride or watch a video. It's going to figure out what those mean, being to see how that'll actually look in the wild. But they are working on it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess you could talk a little bit about that. Maybe maybe people don't really know that they're not everything that we see in the open source Fuchsia repository on, on GitHub is that's not everything that there is. Right. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. So one of the one of the interesting things is there's there's another code name for Fuchsia, and it's called Turquoise. And I've seen some developers say that they're working on Turquoise or they're checking out the Turquoise workflow. And if you look at, if you, you'll see sometimes there'll be a link to Turquoise, you know, the Turquoise review or Turquoise source file or something. And it's completely, if you click on it, it's a 404. Which right. that seems ridiculous, of course, but that just means they're hiding it from people who aren't logged in. Right. So, so inside yeah. of that, there's tons of closed source uh, material. Like, as far as I know, there's only one repository that I've seen reference to, but that holds um, all of all of Google's like UI and apps and things like that that they would want to keep private. Yeah, which which makes you wonder. I mean, obviously, we we we'll talk about this a little bit a little bit more at the end of the show, but we don't really know what Google's plans are for what they're going to do with Fuchsia, and so it raises the question of, you know, are that is, is there going to be a proprietary version of Fuchsia that's going to be, you know, this is this is the open source Fuchsia that we've developed, but here's Google Fuchsia, and and is this private repo that we don't have access to? Is that is that a version of Fuchsia that, that Google's working on that is has all those proprietary pieces built on top? And does that mean, you know, the big question is, does that mean that that's what Google plans to launch publicly? Um, or is that, we can talk about, again, like we can talk about this at the end of the show, or is that going to be what Android becomes, potentially? Um, or, you know, is is, the, is Google just using this this other repository just to build stuff without being scrutinized for their every action? Like, that that's something that I think about, is, like, they, they want to be able to build stuff without us reporting on it in, right. like, in, in 10 minutes or whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, not to mention, I'm sure they they have devices that they may want to not test on the open source, or you know, they might have, you know, as far as I can tell, it seems to just be the UI and and uh, because it it, repl it should, as if my understanding of the documentation is correct, it should just repl or maybe not. <laughs> it would have right. YouTube music. <laughs> it would have. Bad example. <laughs> closed standard closed source Google app would be included, but they don't mm -hmm. want to have open source. But it's it's no different than, or I don't see it as any different than a a, a pixel build of Android versus an AOSP build right. of, of right. Android. Right. It's it's um, the same idea. Yeah. So why don't you talk a little bit about that? You just mentioned the four layers. What maybe you could explain for the layman what 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 are the four layers and and what do they what what were they for? Right. So the bottom layer is Zircon, as we as I mentioned, and Zircon is just a a complete work of beauty. Like it's it's I'm not even a hundred percent sure of everything that it can do just because I don't always understand such low level code. Mm -hmm. But from 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 other judgments that I've seen, people are very impressed with how much they're able to get done with so little code, which is why they they use the term microkernel when talking about it. Uh, again, that that's a concept that sometimes still goes over my head. That's why you haven't seen a full article on Zircon just yet. Uh, still need to get my yeah. head wrapped around that one. But that's the foundation of Fuchsia, and they're trying to make it as low footprint as possible. So. On top of that, they they built on uh, the drivers for you know because of course every computer needs drivers which have to be completely redone. You can't use anything from Windows. You can't use anything from Linux. You have you can't use anything from OS ten. It's all you have to start right, and from scratch. Just to interrupt you a little bit, oh, isn't sure. that isn't that a common criticism of Fuchsia that 
all these drivers are having to be built from the ground up. Like, I mean, maybe you can explain that more from a developer perspective of why that's why that's controversial. But I, I've read, I've definitely read that people saying like, you know, downplaying Fuchsia because it's like, why would you reinvent the wheel or whatever? They seem to be doing it, or everybody's complaining because they want their old devices to work on Fuchsia, where that does not in any way really seem to be Google's goal. They are going to support, they, they're trying to drop all of the cruft of previous generations of computing and just focus on today and tomorrow. Right. Which in the long term should have benefits, but again, I'm not I'm not completely in the loop because I'm not a developer. But haven't some people like used examples of other operating systems that have had to try to, have tried to start from scratch like this um, and have failed? I mean, I can't think of an example right off the top of my head, and I try to be on top of all the comments and everything too, but I haven't yeah. seen. And I know I know people complain about about the about a new operating system generally has trouble with ha having no apps like right. that's what killed windows phone for example but that's mm. not necessarily the same here because it's not a driver situation yeah yeah but we will get oh, yeah yeah so what's the third layer so on top of the graph save your progress as it were and carry it between your devices seamless like now i'm going to move everything over to my phone or now i'm going to move everything to my back to my laptop it should just it more or less should just work like it'll have your recent stories the, the what you're doing currently in each of those in each of the modules in each of the stories just everything, your your whole computing history, just wrapped up and ready to move from and ready to move from device to device. Yeah, I mean that was one of the first posts that you wrote in the Fuchsia Friday series, um, and I think coming from you know my perspective of you know I'm just I'm I'm more or less an average user in comparison to someone who's you know an active developer. Um, that's exciting to me as someone like who's using Android every day to, to be able to have, I mean, <laughs> since I'm a tech journalist, I've got five Android phones sitting here on my <laughs> desk. And if I were able to essentially run the same instance of Android on all of them and have them constantly, um, updated and synced with one another, that would be a dream for me as a reviewer <laughs> right. because it's, it's a mess having to like log into the play store on every single one and install all the apps I need to advances like um, Google messages ha came out finally or Google messages for web came out finally and is able to sync text messages via the internet between your phone and your computer. But that's you know, about as broken as Allo, you can only use it like probably one device at a time. It's and it's you got to use a QR code and it's just a mess. And it's right. inconvenient, really, where it's going to be synced to your account. So I'll be able to make a call using a headset on my laptop if I want to, even if my phone is not even in the same state, it doesn't really matter because it should all sync together. I would assume. Anyway, this is this is still a little out there. I don't have any proof necessarily that this will happen, but it's what I would like to think could happen. Yeah, and you also made distinction in your post about there being a difference between the ledger and a ledger. So what's what's the difference there? Yeah, that's the weird thing. I really feel like ledger is going to be a major part of Fuchsia's marketing strategy because it's as far as i've seen it's one of the only pieces of fuchsia that has its own style guide which that could mm. just be to help make the documentation better so that developers understand what's what and to avoid confusion but it, it specifically states that ledger with a capital l like android <laughs> android with a capital a so Ledger with a capital L is a product that syncs 
information from Fuchsia to the web and back, where Ledger with a lowercase l is one is one user's one piece of their right. whole uh, internet and and computing history and context and everything. So, like one one users may one user may have one application that has one ledger, and these combine together and get sent off into ledger capital L that manages it. Yeah, so with Ledger, this kind of, we now know with Ledger that Fuchsia is somewhat running in the cloud, so to speak. So your, 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 your operating system is being synced across the cloud, you know, to all your devices. So maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, today, all of our operating systems, for the most part, are Ledger to, to, uh, to do that surprisingly it doesn't necessarily all have to stay local but one thing i would like to stress just for the security minded and the security conscious and privacy conscious you do not have to be online you do not have to use the online capabilities you can choose to keep your everything local as it has always okay. been and that that matters to some people too that's a big deal yeah, yeah, you can't just have all of the medical history uploaded all the time. Oh my god, no. So, but um but as far as like keeping things synced, one of the interesting things is that it can save more than just text. It seems to be able to save pieces of files or files into the the cloud as well. Yeah. Now, as far as actual files, like are you going to keep you know your your music files, your video files. People are going to still need to work on things like videos and games. People are going to want to play games, and there's no way that a multi gigabyte game is just going to float around in the cloud from one place to another, or or assets to make something like that, like three D assets that take up tens of megabytes, or or movie production which takes up hundreds of gigabytes that's not just going to float from place to place of course that it seems to be more about keeping context one of the things though that i found is that you might be able to treat an online hard drive as though it were a local hard drive so you may be able to do something like that but even then that's you know, reliant on internet speed and might not be the best solution for people that are in the industry. Yeah. Speaking of that, that's one thing I th I've thought about with, with the ledger and how, you know, how far off it may be from, from practicality on every device, because, you know, we live in America and Verizon has three unlimited plans that aren't actually unlimited. And, you know, data is kind of, unfortunately, in 2018 can still be a bottleneck, not, not just in, in using, you know, hitting data caps, which unfortunately, you know, there's potential for us to, you know, have ubiquitous data caps on our, our lined connections or our wired connections, which would be a nightmare. It is a nightmare for some people in some places already. Okay. Um, yeah, and and not only like I said with wireless, it's not just a matter of hitting your data cap. There's also a speed thing. So like five G, five G, which we it's still not entirely defined what that technology is, is years away from from being you know significantly you know like from from actually like moving up in terms of bandwidth and stuff. Like we're years away from that being ubiquitous, and so there's there's speed caps too. If you don't live in a major city, you might not even have 4G on your devices, and so that's one thing I've thought about with Ledger is, like you said, it, at least with the way the infrastructure works in Fuchsia now, using the Ledger or making Fuchsia work over the cloud is not required, at least based on you know current code, um, but it does seem like that is the ideal you know it seems like that's what google wants it seems like that's what they're building toward and so it seems like to me data seems like 
to me, data may be something that holds for the time being. It, it, it's one of those things that like Google's vision for Fuchsia doesn't seem to be lining up to, with, to me with how fast we're progressing in the problem, at least in the States. And so, you know, that's something I think about a lot. Well, important to remember is that Ledger is offline first, then online. So uh, once it's done saving offline locally, then mm. when you are when you're online, you have a good connection, then it'll try to sync. Also, it can sync peer to peer. That's a new development that they've been working on. So mm. so if if I don't know that it'll I don't know what communications it'll necessarily use to do that. Like right. I would assume you'd need to be on the same Wi-Fi network or it could work by a Bluetooth, but I, I don't know that by any means. So yeah. if, if two devices are in the same network, they can share information directly, but generally the ledger is for saving your place and transitioning from one device to another. So if you're, if you're, using data and you try to switch from your laptop to your phone and and back and forth back and forth that is an unusual case in i in some for some not maybe not e not even for me but for some i would assume that it's an unusual case this is a theoretical question i don't i don't know if we have an answer to this based on the current state of the source code but if you were if we're using ledger on a per app basis so some apps will want um the last write to be the correct one so whichever whichever was the most recent like if you if you worked on your pixel 5 like you said did something there and then you went to your pixel book 8 like you said whichever one connects first or or they're all they're all time stamped so that time right stamp right right the pixel 5 will decide that hey let's you know, oh, the Pixel 8, the Pixel Book 8 is where as the newer timestamp because you used it most recently. And that's assuming gotcha. there's a conflict between what you did. Like if you were doing, if you, if you, if, if Ledger was managing your YouTube watching his, your YouTube view history, for right. example, there wouldn't be a conflict be, just because you watched one video on the, on the phone and one video on the laptop. It wouldn't make a difference. It wouldn't be a right. conflict. They could both just slip right in just fine. So, and that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to just, there's a couple, I forget, I don't remember offhand what the other strategies are, but they're, they've included multiple strategies just to avoid that type of scenario. And they left it open to, to the developer to choose. Or yeah, that the makes wrong. sense. Right. So what about, what about entities? How do, how do entities, that's another thing that you've written about in Fuchsia Friday. How do those connect to Fuchsia and what's the significance and what are they? <laughs> Yeah, so so entities, just about anything is an entity. Like my phone, my phone just is an entity. Or the idea of this phone, the the Huawei P twenty, is an entity. Or just any any physical or digital i thing item yeah. item is an is an entity. So what Fuchsia can do or what Fuchsia apps can do is make these entities available to other apps. Like if I'm, if I have the Amazon shopping app open and I look at an item, suddenly it's tagged as an entity and it has a type with it, which, so like, um, let's say uh, that kind somewhat public in the operating system so that other apps can view it and respond to it like if you're looking at a specific item in amazon and wish or alibaba has a better price for example i don't know if you that may happen you could get a pop-up or a, a a suggestion that hey we have a better deal on this or you can oh they're amazon's out of stock oh well we have stock you can buy direct from us Right. So, so it, like the Alibaba app or whatever can see the entity from the Amazon app and can then act on it. Yeah. Kind of, high level. That's kind of the idea. Yeah. I'm not sure where the security is because there has to be some security. I don't want every 
app I ever open to know about every other app I open and what I do in those apps. Like I, right. I, have, a, I have a little bit more privacy concern than that. <laughs> right. But right. But to manage there's, that, there's something called an agent, right? Like a, an agent, Maxwell, is kind of in control of like what apps get to use what kind of maybe or suggestion or bring up a <laughs> like um one of the examples that they showed in the Tope concerts near and it would fill in the blank with what the hotel is like if i was looking at the peabody in memphis it would show find nearby concerts and or if you were looking at an artist like if you're watching a youtube video of an artist you could get a pop-up or not a, not necessarily a pop-up but a suggestion from spotify that says hey listen to this artist on spotify you would have a cool picture and everything so it, it's really i don't think the imagination has been stretched far enough with what agents can do like i, I they they seem powerful enough that they could do almost anything like a concept that I had when I was originally working on it was that nine to five Google could have an app, a Fuchsia app that you're looking at devices like a phone and you see, you know, you're, you're looking at them on Best Buy, say you click. This is all using entities because it knows like the agent was looking for the entity and the entity an is phone. phone and it's this kind of phone. And then the 9 to 5 Google app was able to say, oh, we have a review of that and then just give you a suggestion on it Bingo. To, to, to read it. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's something that as of today, Android can't do. Right. Closest, the closest we get to things like that on Android right now is like uh, maybe uh, assistant, like yeah. oh, what's Assistant oh, man. Screen or something. Yeah, what's it called? Like, why, why am I, why am I forgetting this? Like right now, but it's when you hold the assistant. Like it used to be, you hold the assistant button, and you know, it would. Yeah, what is it called? I still have I'm really like, mad what's, right now. What's on my screen? Um. Yeah. What's it called? I'm trying I'm to find out now. Beating I myself up for not being able to remember this. I mean, it works just fine. It still works, but you know, because like the the same RAM that I was just looking at popped up. Can't remember, but anyways, yeah. It, it, using Assistant, you can see what's on your dis on your display currently, and then Assistant can recommend things based on the the information that it sees on the display right now. Whereas Fuchsia, it seems like they're trying to build the infrastructure, so you don't even need to do that. Um, they're they're making it so that apps have a high level of interactability without without you know having to intentionally trigger it the user the user doesn't have to say i want to interact between apps yeah the, now the, the important thing to remember is that it's not going to be it's not necessarily going to be disruptive be because um what's going to happen is similar to how you have a google feed or a google what, what used to be google now is the best actually the best example um you can, you'll have suggested as what you can do. By the way, it's it was called Google Now on Tap, but yeah. now now it, now it doesn't really have a name because it's no. just a function. It's just a function of the assistant. You just like click like what's on my screen or whatever. Interesting. Um, there actually is still something called Now inside of the uh, Armadillo code. There's oh, interesting. Now, and there's Next as two separate things. It's inter It's really interesting. I don't know. Is there anything like now on tap or like what's on my screen in Fuchsia or are they? I, I assume they're leaving that all to the agents to make suggestions that it's all going to happen behind the scenes rather than specifically asking for it. Yeah, it makes sense too, because I don't think people really used Google now on tap that much. But for me, it's like, at least with now on tap, it was always like, I always miss those opportunities. You know, like yeah. I think I always think like, oh, I can't remember this, but my brain doesn't go, oh, I should use Google now on tap, especially yeah. since Google now on tap is like eh, 50, 75 percent reliable or whatever. You know, it doesn't get it every time. So it doesn't become part of your habits. You know, um, I'm worried about Google Lentons becoming the same way. Yeah, I'm, I'm worried about the same thing. It's like 
sometimes I'll be, you know, I don't know, doing, doing normal stuff. I'm like, oh, I don't know what fruit this is. Yeah. I don't think in my brain, oh, Google, Google, Google lens can tell me, you know, it's, it's like, I, I still think of things and maybe this is something that we'll just have to change over time. But like, I still think of things through the lens, through the like old manual way of like, asking a friend you know like yeah that's so that's what so like, yeah what is this fruit oh my wife knows what it is cool i don't need to ask google lens or whatever you know right um and and maybe that's just a matter of like it needs to be so good that it gets stuff every single time to where like maybe it has to get that good before you start to learn to use it because otherwise it feels like a waste of time to use it and then it not give you any useful information which or it just needs to be is somewhat, somewhat often. Or it just needs to be like passively or, or just constantly active ish. Yeah. Where, where or yeah, with you decide, show where it's just, yeah. You decide, oh hey, look at that. What's you know, I know what that is, or oh man, what is that? And I just look real quick. Like um like ambient music detection or whatever. I'll absolutely. Like, That's a very idea. good example. Yeah, absolutely. There's so many times where I've been in a restaurant where I'm like, wonder what's that song? I wish I had something that could tell me what that song is. And, you know, I don't realize, oh, I've had Shazam since 2009. You know, I don't, I don't think about yeah. that. Um, but yeah, with the Pixel 9, you know, I don't, I don't think about yeah. that. Um, but yeah, with the Pixel 2 and it automatically listening and, and it popping up on my ambient display, it's like, Oh, like it, I didn't have to ask yeah, it. It just, that, it just, it just told, told me. Yeah. yeah. And it seems like Fuchsia is kind of expanding on that idea, basically. Absolutely. Fuchsia is trying to do all the things Google's wanted to do, but hasn't been able to for reason. So. Right. So what else is there in terms of like, let's see. We got we cover the four layers. We got Zircon, Garnet, Peridot, and Topaz. Um, and then, oh, vendors, we didn't talk about that. Apparently, like, apparently the code shows that, that OEMs will be able to build on top of Topaz. Uh, not necessarily on top of Topaz, but to actually replace Topaz. Because if you, if you really dig in and look at Topaz, yes, there are some useful things. Like there's a, there's a keyboard, you know, cause phones, you need a keyboard. Let's be real. Right. So there's, there's the keyboard, which is not Gboard, I'll tell you right now. <laughs> it's, so, uh, but it's mostly just demo apps and just little things that, that, that are for showing how to write good Fuchsia code, not for actual functional pur purposes. So what, what is allowed to happen is developers for OEM is developers for OEMs and vendors will be able to just completely wipe out Topaz and what Google wrote. They're only changing that top layer, which means updates will still work because it's all built. It's just what's on top that changed. What about Google? What about a Google vendor layer? That's the cool thing. That's the cool thing. I've been holding on to this one. No right. comment on who that may be right now, but it also says to me that Google is absolutely working on a device for Fuchsia that will actually maybe see the light of day. <laughs> or at least testing Fuchsia on, an, on a device that may see the light of day. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Like possibly a Pixel Book 2 or, or 3 or 8. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it's really interesting to me like this whole vendor part or vendor layer thing because you did use our material and developers or designers were like no we don't have enough flexibility with that and so we're just going to not use it at all which has led to the current state of design and android apps vendors to use have their own layer on top of fuchsia is kind of similar it's like we'll let you have your own and we're going to do our own and that's okay that's what yeah. it seems like to me there might be a little bit of a parallel there i don't know if the teams uh, you know, intent did that intentionally, but it's, it's interesting actually, to, me, to see that. Actually, I would not be surprised because while I don't have any hard proof, I am reasonably certain that uh, one of the head honchos of Fuchsia is actually the head of material design, Matthias Duart. He is. He, uh, it, so having that direct connection could mean that parallel like that could be 
True. Interesting. So what's the connection with Duarte to to, um, to Fuchsia? What, what have you found I, or seen? Well, well, for one, he's spotted and retweeted a couple of my Fuchsia-related uh, articles, which that doesn't necessarily mean anything. But he's also been spotted. I haven't seen it, but he has apparently been spotted in the Fuchsia IRC chat, which... Ah. I mean, that'll do it for you, right? Well, yeah, so, it's interesting because, you know, he's a he's a big shot at Google. Like, he's a big deal. And he, he has a lot of influence. And for him to be in the IRC chat for what, from the outside, seems to be a very kind of skunk, skunk worksy kind of, like, project behind the scenes, that, that says something. Right, absolutely. So I, I, I'm not... It's still not something that I can say, like, confirm. Like, yes, he's involved. Yes, he's running this. But it, with as much material as is visible in Fuchsia, it seems implausible to me for him to not be involved in some way. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, what else do other, we have? I would say Go ahead. the real important, the one of the main reasons that they that they did allow the separation like that is to allow updates, which for Android currently and your carrier to handle right. all of that. Where, Which is a mess, we, as we all know. Yes, and doesn't work in the slightest. That's why I have three devices on my desk, one with one on N, one on O, and one sued to be on P, and they, I just can't get them all in the same. So it's a complete mess, but they're... But what Google wants to do is they want to be able to update all the bottom three layers without touching the top, and the top can just be handled by... Yeah. by the vendors, basically. Absolutely. And I'm sure the carrier will still have a little bit of say as well. Right. Unfortunately. <laughs> right. All right. So let's move on to the next kind of bigger topic of you've got future running on your Pixel Book right now, right? Yeah. I, it's not in a very <laughs> demonstrable state right now. Let's put it that way. So uh, for one, the last thing I did on it was uh, get some get those demonstrations ready or that small demonstration ready of Linux running on my uh, on Fuchsia on the Pixelbook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in that aspect, I all, I can't even really turn it on and show it to you. But the other thing is that everything that I showed in the first five minutes of Fuchsia article has gone completely out the window everything really for absolutely everything like they took out um they took out all the cool pictures all of the ba wallpaper backgrounds and all that kind of stuff so and just grayed it out oh my and gosh then they took out the shell or or the user interface oh, so everything that we know as armadillo and the whole user login and everything is put on, put aside to not even be used for a while, which, and they've replaced it with another one called, instead of it being, instead of Armadillo, they've replaced it with, I wanna say Ermine is the way to pronounce it. It's some kind of animal. They, they seem to be, there's always a theme in the naming with every aspect of, uh, every aspect of Fuchsia. Like, uh, so Ermine is like a weasel, a nice weasel kind of thing. <laughs> it's it's the it's it's really cute. You should look it up. It's really cute. But it, it's um so they so what that looks like though is just a command pr or three command prompts. And I'm just left wondering why they even went to that. So interesting. I've seen some hints as to why. I, I assume it's because they're trying to make sure that every app that they want to work on the command prompt will work on the command prompt correctly by focusing in on it and making that this is the focus right now. Don't worry about armadillo. Maybe we've got it all done already or done. So they're focusing in on on the command prompt. Like um, the they're working on the text editor right now, among other things. Right. It might make sense too that you know your first five minutes of fuchsia article. It's like 
that very well may not be the first five minutes of Fuchsia. <laughs> right. right. It, it could actually be all out the window. Maybe Armadillo is getting scrapped and they're starting over. Like, screw yeah. you, buddy. Get out. Like, people it love have it. Been, Forget it. It's out. It should have been first five minutes of Fuchsia, asterisk, as of right now. <laughs> like, yeah. as of yeah. literally, like, this build and the build tomorrow could actually scrap everything, which they did. <laughs> and it happened, like, I want to say less than a week after I published that. So <laughs> I was like, what is happening? So, I, like, I haha, first five go. minutes of Fuchsia? Just kidding. It's command lines. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I don't even know what's going on with that, but I'm, I'm keeping an eye on it for right now. I was hoping to have a build ready to demonstrate before this, but it didn't pan out that way how often do you do you like reinstall it if i'm if i'm doing things the right way i should be doing it almost every day and it would be a lot right. faster if i did it that way but it ends up being more like when i spot something that looks different enough that i need to investigate and and do it that way gotcha that makes sense and especially since all that's changing right now is a command prompt. It's not like there's anything too interesting to show. Yeah, it's, I mean, for those of us, though, that are just crazy uh, about Google, it, it's interesting regardless. So you should do another five minutes of Fuchsia article where you just <laughs> screenshot the command prompts and you're like, this is it. This is <laughs> and I just type random things in for five minutes. Let's make a whole video of that. Just do it. Right. It, so you said there's a text editor or something they're working on right now? Yeah, they're working on a text editor called, uh, ooh, uh, I don't want to get, a, get that pronunciation wrong because they are very, very specific about that one. I knew it, and I knew it, and I knew it, and I forgot. It is pronounced Xi. See, I would have got it wrong. Xi. X-I. Xi. Oh, wait. Wasn't there... Wasn't there something else called Zai that we wrote about? That's exactly it. That's the text editor. Code oh, editor. that is it. Okay. So sure. on every other platform that it's going to be available for, Zai is going to just be a... Rafe Levine, I think. Yeah. Uh, he, he announced this kind of like quietly on like Hacker News or something. Um, and at the time, he did a talk about it. Um, I yeah. forgot where, but yeah, he did a talk about it. And basically the idea was it being like a uh, performance so by having that as the back end and whatever you want as the front end, whether that be Flutter or something, the um, the desktop equivalent on whatever the uh, the desktop uh, equivalent is on, on Mac. Uh, so Because uh, right now the best way that you can use Zai is on Mac, surprisingly. Right. Uh huh. So I, I've been meeting. That's it, it's. That's your future Friday for next week, by the way. <laughs> I'll get him. I'll uh, sure, boss. Send me a Mac first, and I'll do it. <laughs> Call Seth. Uh, tell him I need a MacBook overnight. Hey Seth. Seth. <laughs> Kyle needs a MacBook. <laughs> hey Seth. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's Zai is really interesting to me because it's like Zai. Zai is to code editors as Fuchsia is to operating systems, kind of. It's like it's like a you know we're we're just going to start from the ground up and try to make it as modern and efficient and like fu uh, forward looking as possible. Absolutely, one of the pe one of the things that people have complained about for years now is response time when typing, like. If you if you don't really understand what that might mean or look like, type into your notepad and then try typing into a Google Doc with somebody else signed in. You'll right, notice right, the delay. Right. <laughs> you'll notice the delay. You'll understand what it means then, and you'll understand how painful it is. I was hitting backspace earlier, and I was like, "This is not fast." <laughs> so <laughs> it's the same. It's the same idea. They're trying to get. Sl like smaller and smaller, res faster, faster response times from from typing and just getting everything to respond quickly to your input. That was that was the the core of it all. It seemed like, but it also built into or became 
the Fuchsia's primary text editor is one of the goals that it's supposed to be. So whether that's possibly even typing documents, though I assume that would still be left to Google Docs, but I've heard that even emails are going to be best typed on Xi in Fuchsia. So interesting. I'm well, maybe it, maybe it will serve as the backbone for like text entry in general in the operating system. It very well could. It very well could. It's hard to say at this point. It's still very yeah. much a work in progress. Um, yeah. So let's talk. Speaking of work in progress, I mean, it's it's goes without saying that that Fuchsia as a whole is a is a work in progress, and we really don't know. Like at, as of today, we really don't know what its future holds. We don't really. I mean, all we have is evidence evidence that that Google's taking it seriously, or at least. It seems more seriously than some of its other, you know, Google's always working on dozens of projects across, you know, Alphabet's X division is working on hardware projects all the time. And there's Area 120, which is Google's like in-house kind of software experiment lab where, you know, teams are assigned to build something. And if it fails, it fails. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. And usually these are not that like, they're not really, the people working on them are typically not that key to, 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 to the company. Um, not that they aren't important, but you know they're not they're not rock stars, so, so to speak. And and on in Fuchsia, one of the interesting things, and you've written about this, is that there are a lot of rock stars, like people who are uh, fairly influential. We just talked about Matthias Duarte earlier. Um, he's obviously the head of all material design, all of design at, at Google, and it, he's potentially kind of sort of involved. We don't know for sure. Um, and then there were other people. So like who who else is like has come over from the Android team or or Google has had some outside hires? Like what what does the team look like? So from what I've seen, more so than more so than uh, bring in rock stars that were th that were already in the company for the Fuchsia project, they seem to have hired a lot of new rock stars. Like I. I I absolutely know that I'm going to get his name wrong, but there's a Travis G is, I'm, I'm not even going to try his last name. I just know I'll get it wrong. <laughs> He's like an absolute, like he, he is like probably, he's very, very well regarded as far as kernel development and 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 development of, of new things. Like um, he was involved, if I remember correctly, with the, a lot of people from that team. And, and of course he's worked on it crazy other projects before that. Every time I, I try and talk about him, people always say, you're not giving him enough credit. He also worked on this, this, and this. And I'm like, okay. He's so, not just the sidekick guy, Kyle. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> so he's like, he, he's got this incredibly storied history and it's like almost nonstop. I, I, people, I'll see like references, but th that's, there's other things like that. Like, um, the Flutter project, which is very closely tied with the Fuchsia project. Flutter, we talked about it before, of course, on 95 Google. Yeah. Flutter is uh, Google's new app development software that is also being used as Fuchsia's primary app development software. Moving on, just that little brief. The, the head or the leader or creator, one of those, it's hard to say really, of the Flutter team is Ian Hickson, who is well regarded as being the author of the HTML5 specification. Interesting. So, I mean, of course, there were a lot of other parties involved with that, but he was like the the neutral one, as it were. Yeah, it's actually interesting, Flutter in general, because Flutter is something that Google is not hiding at all. You know, like no. Google has... Google's very forward about what Flutter is and what they're trying to do with it. And it's and I, I don't think a lot of people know that Flutter, the Flutter and Fuchsia teams are so intertwined. For the longest time, and it may even still be the case, I'll have to check the issue tracker again, but for the longest time, Flutter directly depended on Fuchsia, Fuchsia that's, code. That's crazy. Like from the beginning, it depend, depended on it, which is incredible because as far as we had known, Flutter or sorry, Fuchsia had only really started in like 2015, 2016. But I've seen a reference that said something along the lines of copyright or yeah, copyright the Fuchsia authors that was dated 2013, I believe even. 
I have to find the reference on that again for those interested, but it's crazy that it's actually been in development for this long secretly, but then they found out, hey, we can spin a separate product out of this, bring it to the forefront. Yeah. Another another thing that's really interesting about Fuchsia is that uh, the team's growing really fast, right? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So we we talked about, or I had, meant, I had written about in uh, April that about the size of the Fuchsia team and just some, some general stats about that. Since then, they've grown by 25%, which is huge, I would say, to grow from about 160 to over 200. That's that's a that's a large growth in in, in two months two, two months, that's yeah. yeah that's a huge amount of growth and it just goes up. I check the numbers every week and there's there seem to be new, and this is this is just that's probably not even close to an accurate number because that is just developers who have committed code right. to the few the four fuchsia the main four future repositories, that's not even outside of that realm. And that's right. not even people that do artwork or people that are man or managing. That's just coding developers. Right. And so it's probably, a, it's probably a significant part of the number, but it's definitely not everyone. The whole of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So one of the interesting things that, that, we, that people have talked about. I guess there's, I talked about this at the beginning of the show and I, I guess we can we can wrap the show up also talking about this is that people kind of have this idea that there, that, that, that Fuchsia is just going to be the sequel. Like, like Android is OS one and Fuchsia is OS two. And, and we don't, we don't really know that. Um, it's, 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 it's not clear exactly what Google's plan is. All that is clear is that Google is, uh, taking it seriously and investing and reinvesting, um, and so you know that's that's part of why we we cover it. And by we, I mean Kyle. Kyle's the one that's digging in every week and posting Fuchsia Friday every week. And if 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 you haven't read those, you should definitely read those. They're in the show notes. We've got all like I don't know. He's done like fifteen of them at this point or more, um, and he's continually to crank out content every week. Uh, that's just a side note, but. You know, there, there's this question of is is Android is Fuchsia going to be a sequel to Android? Is it like does Android have a few more years left before it's just like gonna die? Which there's one interesting aspect to that is that Google seems to be backing away from the Android brand in a lot of ways. We've seen over the last year or so, we we saw Android Wear go to Wear OS. We saw Android Pay go to Google Pay. We've seen we've seen Google kind of like shying away from the Android brand. And we've talked about that on Alphabet Scoop before. And so that raised the question of is Google moving away from the Android brand and is Fuchsia as a brand or whatever they decide to call it, is that going to come in and replace Android? Or is there, you know, are they taking a different approach, which would be, you know, is, is Android as a brand uh, gonna stick around, but on the back end, is, is Google gonna, you know, very sneakily replace bits and pieces of the underlying operating system over time or 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 rather than that just slowly change android to be more and more like fuchsia from a user facing perspective and then at some point quietly change the underlying code um it's, it's a lot of questions and we don't know the answers to them um but yeah, one, one thing to, to note is that Android has been adopting a lot of things, and I think we mentioned this a little bit at the top of the show, a, a lot of things that uh, do seem to resemble Fuchsia, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like, they've added something called App Actions, which will kind of work either something like Modboom, there's an App Action a ride to this place. Yeah, and the other thing was uh, app bundles, which are kind of sort of like modules in a way, right? Yeah, yeah. Because and then you say, you know, oh, I'm just gonna simple as like in a, in a in a video app. It might even be simple as if there's tabs at the top of the display. If you never tap the upload one, it never downloads the upload piece of the app. But as soon as you tap it, it downloads like 500 kilobytes of data, and it gives you that piece or whatever. Exactly, exactly. And Fuchsia is possible going to work the same way, but more so what's going to happen as far as keeping the pieces like that as on Fuchsia is that if you 
don't have an app installed, you'll be able to you, you'll be able to use right, right, right. just a piece of it and just download just that piece of it and use it that way, which is similar to another Android feature that's coming official page. Away from the Android brand in a lot of ways, um, but they also are making Android more like Fuchsia. So maybe they're just hedging their bets. <laughs> the interesting thing to me is that where they aren't shying away from the Android brand seems to be internationally, like the Android One initiative or movement or that 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 branding that's now coming out seems to be more focused on um, developing countries right. where where some of the more fuchsia like features aren't going to make sense because like where where we're complaining about data ubiquity here can you even imagine in a developing country yeah <laughs> these features would not work so right. it, it may be that I've heard some talk about uh, Android becoming a lesser brand name, like, you know, oh, okay, well, it's an Android. All right, that's fine. It, right. It's... Like, hmm, that's interesting. I never thought about that. Like, like Android could be, so as Android is to Android 1 today, Android is to Android 1 today, Fuchsia could be to Android. So like the, for sure. Yeah. And, and it's hard to say, like, they could still use the Android name. It could yeah. very well happen that way because there's nothing that says that the name Fuchsia is in any way permanent. Right. It's, it could easily just be Android. <laughs> yeah, if they really wanted it to. But it seems, I don't know, the, the organization of it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me to do it that way. Yeah. Another thing is app compatibility. So like, is there any evidence that legacy Android apps will be able to run on Fuchsia? What's, what's the status of that? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I've been watching some stuff this week. Like there's a commit that's been going back and forth. Like if I if I were to describe a little bit of how this this email chain has gone, it seems like the Fuchsia and Android teams, or at least these two members, from an outsider's perspective, reading text, not listening, it yeah. seems like they're butting heads a little bit. <laughs> like <laughs> they, the one the the Android team member made it very clear to the Fuchsia team member that Fuchsia is not a first class citizen of the Android runtime. He was <laughs> very clear about that. And I was I was like, wow, that's um intense. Now, I mean that's still nothing compared to if you ever read some of the emails that Linus Torvald sends out. That's intense. He'll cuss you out at a drop of a hat if you're if you're stupid to him. So <laughs> It, it could be a whole lot worse. It's just like, wow, that's. But yes, the point is, um, there, there, there is work happening right now to make the Android runtime be able to work using Zircon system calls, which could mean future compatibility. That I, that's really not the way that I expected them to do it. To actually port the whole Android runtime over to Fuchsia. Mm -hmm. That seems like the hard way to do it and the long way around, especially um, considering what I had talked about last week in, or in last week's article was that Linux app support is coming to Fuchsia, but it's coming through or it seems to be coming through an emulator. Right. So that was like your most recent Fuchsia Friday. I guess we can right. uh, rightfully and fittingly like close the show out with, with what you talked about last week. So that was... Is it called Machina or Ma Ma I was in Machina or Machina, Machina? Machina okay. but I mean, I'm assuming Machina, like Deus Ex Machina. That's my assumption. I, I've <laughs> until you hear it pronounced, it's really hard yeah. to know. So it what it what it's going to do is it's just going to boot up a little emulator and start an app inside of that, and then you're off to the races. It works on a similar principle to how Chrome OS gained. Uh, gained Linux app support recently with its Crustini project. But it goes further than that, too, because I've seen the beginnings of support for Machina in the Chromium. Uh, it's a stretch. There's, not, there's no real evidence. There's no real proof. But it seems to me that Chrome OS apps will also be supported by Fuchsia. Interesting. 
That's 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 really interesting considering uh, just I don't has that ever happened where a new operating system has been released where they built in support for two of the companies that same company's previous operating like that's that would be a, that would be a new thing it seems like to me. It, it just reminds me of backwards compatibility in video games, you know. Yeah, yeah, you except thing, and it can still do the old thing. Right. Yeah, that's that's crazy. Um, so I guess to round this off, we, you you also did a post about some devices that we think Google's testing uh, Fuchsia running. Yeah, one is that that makes me think that they might be moving away from the Android. They might be moving away from the Android things. Is they've they seem to be testing a smart speaker. Because it's it, the the way I'm able to guess that is that the chip that they're basing it all around is audio only. There's no video on this chip. There's no video processing. There's no video output. There is nothing. It is audio only. And there's a demonstration of people using that same chip to run an Alexa device, That's a homemade Alexa device. So hmm. they're they're calling that. Um, Goss, which I was like, man, that is an intimidating name and has no <laughs> meaning to me whatsoever. And then I'm just on a whim. I'm like, let me go to Wikipedia or something. Right there on Wikipedia, first like first paragraph, it says one Goss is equal to one Maxwell per square centimeter. I'm like, it all makes sense. It's one. There's Maxwell hidden, there's hidden meanings in everything. Yeah, everything has a meaning. Like a, a Maxwell, uh, I, I, as I noted in the Maxwell article, Maxwell is a reference to Maxwell Smart from the TV series Get the '60s TV series Get Smart. <laughs> so it, it seems like everything has a reference. Uh, Kronk, the the code name for yeah, I forgot the about Kronk. The code name for the assistant is, is, is being Kronk is funny because you know he's Isma's assistant, and. <laughs> And there's like an, a sub code name inside of there. Like there's something that that handles um, voice that and they call that Bucky, which is the squirrel that Kronk talks to. Like everything is a reference to something. So I knew yeah. Goss would have to be something. Uh, I, and there's one more device, though, that I, that has a code name that I haven't figured out the, the meaning of, and that's Astro. And all I really know about Astro is that it's based around what's typically a TV box or an Android TV chip. So it's um, TV tuner capability and and like as an incoming cable uh, TV input and uh, outgoing video outputs and stuff like that. But it also has a uh, Goodix fingerprint scanner inside of it. Mm which i mean and just a touch sensor in general but good goodix is known for their um in display thing, fingerprint scanners so i'm thinking to myself what kind of tv box also itself has the the screen and the tv has a touch screen and needs a fingerprint scanner yeah I'm i can't still, think of anything i still haven't figured that one out it's so it does too many things for me to figure out what it can, what it's supposed to be. I have another device to add to that list, which is we talked about this last week. So if you if you didn't watch last week's Alphabet Scoop show, you should definitely go check that out. Um, we talked a little bit about a supposed Pixel Two, Pixelbook Two. Uh, we don't we don't know whether or not you know we don't really under we don't really know the level of you know trustworthiness or validity to this information. Um, but there's year or two, so that's. I mean, it's 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 hard to say because I mean, it, Fuchsia works on today's Pixel Book, so it's hard to make any references there. But one right. thing to be too terribly much different about it, it should right. still have an Intel processor. It should still have a lot of the same internals, just upgraded. Right. Which general sometimes when you're when you're doing a driver for devices like that the next model up can still work reasonably well on the previous generation's driver, or you can change a couple things 
and it's working just fine. So it should it's not unreasonable to me at all that they could have Fuchsia uh, uh, the same using the same current today Pixelbook 1 code working on a Pixelbook 2. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that pretty much serves as a Fuchsia 101. I, 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 we pretty much have hit every single you know point that, that gives you kind of an overarching view of, of everything that Google's been doing with Fuchsia for the last couple of years. Um, a lot of these things Kyle dug up over the last several weeks over on 9to5google.com. Uh, and he's been doing this series called Future Friday, as I mentioned. And if you want to keep following all the latest developments in Fuchsia, you should head over to 9to5google.com and uh, read his articles. He's, he's pretty awesome. <laughs> you flatter me. Thanks for uh, coming on. And uh, uh, until, until next week, you can tune in to, uh, well, I guess next week you can tune into Alphabet Scoop. Uh, as as we always have this show here every Friday uh, live and recorded and published on all your favorite podcasting platforms every uh, Saturday morning, such as iTunes, and Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, which is a new addition to the list, uh, Pocket Casts, Google Play, and you can even listen over at 9to5google.com. So thanks for tuning in as always. And thanks, Kyle, so much for joining us for this 15th episode of Alphabet Scoop. <laughs> no, no problem. Thanks for having me. Thanks.